Thank you very much for having me here. Really appreciate the opportunity to actually come and share the roadmap and the vision and a little bit of strategy behind how we think about integration from a Microsoft perspective. It's been an interesting past with BizTalk. Um, sure, I'm preaching to a choir when I talk about BizTalk and what the history has been. But what hopefully you'll see here today should reinforce the confidence that Microsoft is very serious about integration as a business and where we are and we want to take this forward, including some of the demos you're going to see today in, in this session as well as the rest of the day and tomorrow, will reinforce where our strategy is and what we are aiming for. So I'll probably explain my title. I know it's pretty long, and unfortunately, I don't control how titles at Microsoft get done. But a little bit about me, because I'm standing in for Josh Twist, who's on my team, and uh, he runs the integration uh, workload now. Uh, he couldn't make it for medical reasons, so he kind of just flew in. And I was thinking to myself, you know, what makes me even remotely qualified to speak about integration, apart from the fact that we just kind of work on it right now. So my past has a little bit been on everything from Windows Server System Center when I started at Microsoft about 13 years ago. And along the way, I've done some fun stuff. Uh, how many of you remember App Fabric Comp App? Oh my god. Oh my god. OK. You're probably the only people in the world who know this anymore. So uh, we've kind of done a lot of interesting stuff. Some of them have seen the light of the day. Some things like Comp App, uh, which was probably the most fun 12 months of my life building something which didn't really ship in the end of the day as a GS service. But we learned a lot on what it takes to build the next generation of cloud design applications and how we integrate with hybrid, how do we make things simpler, and we make it ready for next generation. So along the way, I uh, worked on Workflow a little bit, worked on SharePoint uh, with some folks like Kevin in the room, and probably see them later today as well. And a lot of those technologies in the past morphed in some shape or form to build a newer set of uh, technologies including the Azure Resource Manager. For those of you familiar with uh, Azure and use it, <clears throat> the engine behind the Azure Resource Manager is a core orchestration engine, which powers the very backbone of Azure. And that's something that our team also works on and owns. There are folks from that uh, team here as well a will bit chat with. Of course, we build on the Azure portal. <clears throat> along the way, did some service bus and caching. So we did a whole bunch of middleware app plat along the way, and with a very interesting history with doing both hybrid in integration and business process management as well. So today, uh, you, know, you folks are definitely way more familiar with the space and have decades of experience than, than we do. So we'd love to make this a two-way conversation, get a lot of feedback. And uh, you'll see both my Twitter handle as well as my email address on most slides. So you can reach out to us, uh, and I can channel it to the product group folks who are sitting here with me. So we hear from you on what first you think about the strategy we're sharing with you right now and more importantly, a uh, way you would like to shape this. And that's where we're in a very unique spot today where it doesn't take us three years uh, to come up with the next version. It takes us you know, three weeks and three weeks, probably in certain cases three days, to come up with the next feature, the next feature, and ship it really, really fast so we can, you know, along the way, build the product that you guys want and what your customers and partners in turn need. So before I get into where we are any, you know, today, just want to say a huge thank you to the folks in this room. You guys are our best set of partners and customers who've kind of shepherded the whole integration space and have you know, guided us, kept us honest. So a huge, huge thank you. I'm very humbled to be here, uh, standing in front of you guys and actually talking to you about integration when some of you are probably you know, experts and have some of them books, some faces I recognize from the past. But it's been a huge help to us to have you guys uh, carried the flag for integration as an as a overall workload, but overall space for keeping Microsoft honest in the enterprise tier one workloads. So thank you again uh, for, for bringing us where we are and, and keeping us honest. Uh, I want to start off by just giving a very quick snapshot of what's happened in the last six to nine months. Uh, you know, we've, we used to earlier have three, three roadmaps, but the last six months have been very exciting. Everything from the last uh, GA of the BizTalk 2013 R2 uh, we've been getting a lot of feedback, what's working well, what's not working well. And then back in December, for those of you who remember the last integration summit, my boss, Bill Staples, uh, he, he, I think, got up on the stage and made, made a very bold statement that said, in less than a quarter, we will rebuild the entire integration stack to be unified, integrated with the rest of our app lab. And we, we made a lot of people work a lot of late nights to make that happen. Uh, so if you see a lot of people with droopy eyes, it's probably 
uh, because of the fact that till about two weeks ago, they were busy trying to launch the preview of Azure App Service. We'll talk a lot more about that uh, through this session and, and the rest of the day. But that was uh, our first big bet on doubling down our investments on integration, orchestration, uh, <clears throat> what we call logic apps, and we'll talk about that in a second. The whole uh, connectivity space, both on-prem and in cloud and in hybrid mode, uh, was one first step as the, with the Azure App Service launch. Along the way, uh, to make these investments more real, we also GA the API management, which helps pull out a lot of the data which is today locked within IT or with legacy systems to make them more accessible so integration becomes a lot more, more easier with those. So API management was great, but more, more than the technology on the slide, the thing I want to call out is with your support and help, we've had a very, very vibrant community and you guys have helped fuel a lot of that. We've had you know, thousands of, of subscribers to the newsletters of the integration workload uh, all up who you know, listen to what's going on and in addition to the, the community authored newsletters, we have a whole bunch of blog posts which even since the last uh, three weeks have had like a 30% growth week on week in terms of just uh, people reading it and get, you know, getting learning the, the whole platform on uh, what's being offered from Microsoft as well as what uh, the new platform capabilities offer. Of course, for us, it was a first preview and we're rapidly learning, but every blog post that you guys either write or help answer or respond to on forums is one huge step forward in making sure that our roadmap is locked in real customer data and we're actually using data-driven uh, input to make decisions as opposed to just purely based on what we back in Redmond might think is, is what customers want. So huge thank you. And uh, Mark made, uh, reminded me that we are still on track for getting nominations for the App Integration Partner Award, which will be awarded at WPC in July. So we're still on track for that. And hopefully, uh, it could be one of uh, you in the room as well who gets nominated for this. So uh, stay on track for this one. But I just want to give you, you know, start off the session by giving a very quick snapshot of, of the momentum that's being built in the last six months, and we're just getting started. Uh, to understand a little bit of what the strategy is, I want to take a few minutes and reflect on how we got here, including the Azure App Service launch, as well as other investments we're going to make. And I'll share some personal stories about, it's not only about technology and the community effort, it's also about how we are uh, reorganizing ourselves back in Redmond, how the investments are, are increasing in the space, and we're we'll happily, happy to sh you know, chat more about that uh, during social hours as well on what we're doing to strengthen the forces behind this workload. So uh, we've been you know, working uh, on the Azure platform all up, and we've been looking at hundreds of thousands of applications that are being built. <coughs> A lot of the customers we, you know, who build these applications, we look at why they're using cloud, what's causing them to shift, what are the primary motivations, and a few things pop out repeatedly. They're using Azure uh, for its hyperscale. And hyperscale is not just the fact that we have 19 data centers. It's the fact that you can reach customers in parts of the world which you typically could not have thought about before. So reach, availability, just the, the on-demand on availability of capacity are some very, very critical promises of the cloud, which Azure delivers. And hence, a lot of new applications are being built or existing applications are migrating to use a cloud platform. The second and the most critical promise of a lot of these applications is agility. It's cloud, uh, the conversation of cloud started being as a cost saver. And we soon realized that you know, cloud shift is not, uh, it's not all about saving money. Sometimes it is when you have peak capacity uh, workloads. But it's a lot more about being agile in how you can deliver solutions to your customers and partners and do it in a, in a way where you can quickly measure it using insights. And that's the third pillar, which is being able to get live telemetry live usage statistics, and then have a build, measure, learn loop to go feedback into the product on what is going well. And of course, this is you know, across the spectrum of you know, hundreds of thousands of customers as well as the millions of applications which are built in cl cloud all up. But when we focus a little bit more into what the app services in Azure today are being used as, uh, we look at a couple of you know, services across the Azure websites, which has been widely successful and more importantly, more than the fact that it's a web application uh, stack, it gives us insights on what works well, what doesn't work well, what's been super successful in bringing a huge funnel of new business and new opportunities to not just Microsoft, but to our partners as well, are great learnings that I'll probably share with you in the next slide on what it, it did to us as a cloud platform, as an app platform, 
group to understand uh, which kind of services, what kind of capabilities and features work extremely well in the cloud environment. And of course, we had mobile services. Some of you probably played with it as well, which helped us with the second shift, which is the world becoming a lot more mobile first. And a lot of capabilities, again, what worked well, what didn't. And of course, last year when we shipped BizTalk services, it was a great, great platform for learning. It was not never supposed to be a BizTalk server uh, you know, alternative in the cloud. It was a net new capability targeting both the BizTalk brand, but more importantly, the cloud design point on what it takes to think of integration and business process management in a very different light. And BizTalk services created a whole bunch of great learnings, and I'll probably share a few in the next uh, two slides. So looking at these patterns, a couple of things pop at us. And you know, these, these are typically slides we, we use internally, but for this audience, I just want to bring it out and, and, and talk about what we learned and how this helped us shape our strategy and be very transparent about what's, you know, what was going well, what's not going well. And hopefully some of these learnings will apply to your own businesses, but it definitely will help put a lot of perspective on why we are going down the path we plan to go down. So a couple of things that, that really, really worked well for Azure websites. And just to put in perspective, it is the largest service in Azure in terms of number of applications and customers. Just the breadth of customer funnel that gets created by a service like Azure websites is just gigantic. We have other services like infrastructure, virtual machines, cloud services, which are very high-end services. But Azure Websites single-handedly is the largest in terms of uh, raw volume of customers and applications that get built. What made that happen was it was super easy to get started. And you know, we'll contrast that with a couple of other services we have. But the ease of getting started, at, both from a cost perspective, but also from a learning uh, curve and complexity perspective, was super critical, super critical for Azure Websites to be as successful as it finally became, uh, with, as we know it today. Second thing that really helped us, it, us be successful with the service was uh, with the help of our partner ecosystem. That was one service done right, where we not just thought we can build it right in Microsoft, but actually use the help of our partners, much like yourself, as well as customers contributing back to the community to go fuel the growth of that service. So everything from templates or apps or tools, including first party tools like Visual Studio, but a whole bunch of third party tools that got built that fueled the uh, adoption and, and usage of the service. Of course, cost effectiveness was the fundamental thing, and that's the reason when we talk about Azure App Service today, we'll talk about why we decided to have a single host, a common host across all services, because we, with the website's experience, we end up building a super high density host which can be single tenant or multi tenant and can seamlessly scale without the user ever seeing it. So that's an example of how one technology baked over several years is going to get reused in, for the rest of the stack to make it a unified stack. A couple of other things, in, in, including auto load balancing, auto scale, GODR, a lot of those things took it from not just being easier to get started, but an enterprise scale service without the customer ever seeing a seam between the grow up path. And that was, those are things that really, really worked well for a service like Azure Website. Of course, there were gaps. Uh, there still are some gaps in terms of things we need to go work on. Uh, business logic integration is the top one that keeps coming in. And of course, uh, to this audience, it probably resonates a lot more. Being able to you know, not just offer a website or web application or web API, but also being able to integrate it with uh, a business logic, a trigger, a rule, or a, a workflow is very, very critical as these applications become more line of business or uh, end up becoming either partner facing or customer facing. So that was you know, a, one of the slides that we use internally when we do our reviews with our management. And we figured, how can we take all our learnings for Amazon websites and compare it and contrast it with other services uh, that we've had? And then what we did as a second step was pulled in all the learning we got from Azure BizTalk services. And a great, great uh, service which gave us foot in a door to understand what a cloud-based integration platform might look like. A couple of things that came out really well was it validated the value of the BizTalk brand. You know, uh, we were joking on the last advisor's call, which is, we keep thinking, should we keep the BizTalk name, should we drop the BizTalk name? And that debate's been probably going on for the last several years. But I think one of the things that the, the launching the service did was it reinforced how valuable the, the BizTalk brand itself is to this whole space in the community and, and the confidence it reinforces with customers who is using BizTalk. So it's safe to assume the BizTalk name is, is, is here to stay. And uh, in fact, we'll see a lot more of it being used in the context 
of our cloud offerings as well, not just on-premises. Of course, I think uh, you probably heard a lot more about the tier one offerings in the enterprise space this morning from Paul, and uh, that should reinforce our investments that are gonna continue on being both enterprise focused as well as tier one, but the BizTalk name and the brand itself is a very great validation of uh, launching this uh, cloud service. The second thing it helped us do really well was identify what patterns work well. You know, in the, in the on-prem world, things like DTC and distributed transactions made a lot of sense. In the cloud world, not so much, but we need something that replaces an architecture which can, we can still do you know, distributed uh, coordination and workflow, and those are things that was a great learning bed uh, based on these services. And of course, the other thing that re it reinforced both for Microsoft as well as the, our business was that hybrid is super critical. It's a unique differentiator for Microsoft, but more than the fact that it's a, a differentiator for us to win business against most of our competitors, it's less so that as much as is the fact that a lot of large customers and partners have bet their businesses on our software stack and they've deployed on premises for, for, and for whatever reason, for a while, the world of both being in the cloud and on private cloud or on-prem will, will definitely exist. The ability to bridge that seamlessly is what makes BizTalk's uh, suite or the integration suite very, very unique and critical to uh, success of our, our customers and partners who have taken a bet on our stack. Of course, everything is not rosy, and, and those of you who've used the BizTalk services, including a lot of folks in this room, have given a few of the bullet points I've listed here as feedback that came out in the last six to eight months of learning. We need, you know, there's feedback around, <clears throat> if it's a cloud integration platform, we need a lot more connectors that can pull in data and, and can t write to other data sources. Very obvious feedback. We went out with a few of the obvious ones, but there's a huge ecosystem that needs to exist for this platform to be as successful as what this talk was when it was on premises. A couple of other things, including pipeline templates. Templates it was a general theme that we keep hearing about being able to get started using a whole bunch of boilerplate uh, templates and code, but also being able to not just run the service as a SaaS offering, but something more like PaaS where you have control over injecting on custom code. So that was a, a, a recurring theme in the feedback uh, we've, been, we've been gathering from you all uh, over, the, over the last few months as well. And the obvious ones on where's the rules engine, I want long running workflows, and I'm pretty sure you can write this list uh, better than I can uh, with, with the things that you would love to see in the service. But bottom line being, it was very obvious to us that we need to make a lot more investment in the stack to make it have the same level of credibility and, and, and value that our BizTalk server on-prem uh, offered. For me, uh, however, there were a whole bunch of these you know, things that jumped at us, but the thing that mattered the most, I think uh, Josh probably shared uh, the slide in one of the uh, webcast and advisor calls. This was the most critical insight for us. Kind of goes back to what Azure Websites also taught us was, today when you start with both BizTalk server on-premises, but also in the cloud, the complexity curve is significantly high that it's almost an adoption blocker. To even do some basic integration, what it takes to get started is a massive chasm between what, the, the, what most of our customers are ready to go investigate and, and attempt today versus what, where they need to be to realize some value. And it's, it's not even hockey stick, it's like the most steep curve in terms of actual adoption. And hence, a lot of, uh, you know, back in the day when I was on the workflow team, a lot of our projects and POCs used to fail because the, the level of expertise it required to get the, even the most basic integration going was significantly higher than what most customers were ready to go invest in. We used to bring in partners to help out, but for a POC, there's only so much help you can get. Even for them, it was a lot higher uh, time and investment required to make it, make it work well. So it kind of almost felt like a wall which you had to climb up before you could even get the, the slightest of value in this whole space. And that, among everything else, stood out the most to us on things we need to go address with a new strategy. And then we looked at what a lot of uh, customers are actually doing, are trying to work around the offerings that we have, including a lot of offerings that our partners have, to be in this zone, what we call the hack zone, where they would cobble together a mini workflow engine, a mini process engine, just because they really do not want to have the complexity to understand how uh, all this works in the background, that they would just go cobble something else. And of course, when you take it to scale, it doesn't work very well. And there's a very big drop off between what the hack zone is and where the productivity zone really kicks in. So you know, we keep st staring at this, this graph and saying, how can we actually uh, go be a different player where you don't have to have a million dollar 
solution and like hours and hours of uh, figuring out and breaking your head on to figure out how to get the minimum value. But instead, enable a curve where we can have a lot bigger funnel and opportunity to get started very quickly and then grow up uh, as, you know, in a gradual way and then pull in all the, the help from the ecosystem and the partners and what, what the uh, rest of the industry offers to finally get to a very high value. But without the initial, initial funnel, it's really, we are leaving out a whole bunch of potential opportunity in business on the table. So with all that backdrop of what the industry is doing, how customers are, are using the platform and moving to the cloud, how mobile world looks like, uh, we, we started defining down and penning down what our vision uh, for integration all up looks like in the world of modern businesses. And essentially, it boils down to three things. You know, there was a lot of internal debate on how, what features should exist, what uh, capabilities we should offer, not offer. But ultimately, uh, you know, from my perspective, it really boils down to three big things. We truly want to democratize uh, integration and bring it to the masses. The goal is not that we take something which is usually very, very hard and needs a lot of stuff and just give it for free. That, you know, de democratizing can have very different connotations. I want to really spend a few minutes explaining. For us, democratizing means reaching, instead of hundreds or thousands of customers, but reaching millions of customers instead and having a gigantic funnel where a lot more customers can use it and grow up as needed as the business evolves, as opposed to you know, having to wait out or trying to build something very custom and then uh, not being able to take that forward. So being able to reach the masses and make it very easy and very approachable is a fundamental pillar for a lot of the investments uh, either you heard about this morning or here for the next two days and where a lot of our cycles are going to be. Of course, we have to balance this out with all the enterprise focus and tier one focus we have. So it's, it's about a continuum, it's not about one. And hence, the other spectrum that we have is we want to be the iPaaS leader. Uh, Bistock server has been the, uh, in the magic quadrant for, for like several years now uh, on the, in the on-prem world. And that's great uh, from an integration perspective. When we start defining these new magic quadrants for iPaaS or integration pass, that's where you know, being uh, enterprise focused, hybrid, uh, having a rich, you know, scalable platform, cost effectiveness, uh, tier one support, 24-7, SLA, auto scale, DR, like the, all the hundreds of features that are required to actually be the magic quadrant is the other end of our spectrum that we want to aim for. So we want to start from the super democratized version, but ha have in, a, in our uh, Nostra being the iPaaS leader as the uh, segment we're aiming for. And of course, one, the third thing which is most critical for us is we do not and cannot and will not do it alone. This is, uh, this is the only way to win and do well in this platform is to have an ecosystem play. And the platform is, is being architected, and you'll see a lot of demos today that reinforce that. The platform is being built in a way where partners can just seamlessly plug in and offer value without having to do something artificial or understand different concepts or use things which are not documented or just hack around system. That is a, that's a recipe for disaster, and that's the reason why a platform built with ecosystem in design, aka extensibility, pluggability, marketplace, think of all the things required for bringing value, not just from the bunch of folks sitting in Redmond trying to code this thing out, but from hundreds and hundreds and thousands of partners and customers like you, who actually can bring a lot more value and reach a lot more customers that we reach out to by plugging into this ecosystem. So if you don't take any, anything away from this whole deck. The only slide I want you to leave, leave you guys with this is this vision that we have. And a lot of the announcements over the coming weeks and months that we keep hearing will fall into one of these investment areas. Either we are trying to make it easier and more approachable, or we're adding some super cool high-end stuff to make sure it's uh, reinforcing the value that we're going to be the iPaaS leaders in this space. Or we're doing things to make our partners uh, more successful and customers are able to reach a lot more partners, whether it's actual connectors and solutions or being able to get their services natively in the platform. Let's uh, spend a few minutes to see how this actually translates into a real roadmap and uh, strategy. If you see uh, where the business is today, most customers, uh, mo sorry, most businesses trying to serve customers are trying to you know, optimize in one of the three possible dimensions. One is they're trying to make their own employees a lot more productive. Think of the mobile workforce, think of 
to folks who need access to that particular uh, customer insight report or the last PO or the last deal that happened on the fly. Either you, you know, the, your employees need to be empowered and being uh, ready in a, in a mobile cloud first to co compete with uh, your competitors, or you're optimizing on the other extreme, extreme of the spectrum, which is you're engaging a lot more with your customers and make them get a lot more value from what you offer. So the same set of customers or uh, increasing set of customers getting a lot more value uh, from your business by using the same set of resources without, because I'm sure no, no, none of us have the luxury of uh, getting a, a big fat uh, IT paycheck or IT budget. So the way this happens is fundamentally is to the transformation of business built on top of a lot of modern applications, <clears throat> which take into you know, advantage of the three things we talked about earlier, insight, agility, and being able to hyperscale. And you'll see this uh, you know, repeatedly in the themes as well, which is a platform, especially a, a new modern integration platform, which is, does not offer insights and capabilities into looking at what's happening, what's working well, what's not working well out of the box, is pretty much dead on arrival. So a lot of these applications will be built to not just provide insights to you as the end user, but also the platform to, as an application builder or integration provider. Insights are natively available because it's designed to be uh, you know, data first and cloud first uh, from the beginning. Agility, we've talked about that a bit already, but being able to rapidly iterate, you know, measure using insights, and then being able to put that uh, feedback loop back into this app is very, very critical. And the last part is very interesting. Uh, I think we might have a session, I'll probably let Mark confirm, on, you know, we should think of uh, integration and business process management in a very traditional sense of connecting to typical LOB systems. But the opportunity offered by a completely new class of scenarios like IoT for integration is just tremendous. And the cloud platform which is built to be able to connect to those uh, systems is fundamentally critical to expanding the pie that we all are, are aiming for. If you're going after the same set of existing scenarios, it's interesting, but when you bring in all the new scenarios around uh, not just mobile, but IoT, the pie becomes very interesting and a very complex thing to go deal with very quickly. But that's what uh, you know, hyperscale cloud helps you enable is you don't have to worry about a lot of, lot of those things from scale. It's just handled for you when you can actually th not just deal with hundreds of transactions, but billions of events uh, flowing through the system. Think of integration that's in that context. It's just mind-boggling on what the system needs to be able to go, to go support that. So that's, that's how we see uh, the, the actual strategy play out in being able to build apps which can take advantage of all of these. In terms of actual technology, uh, we talked about you know, these three services which are being offered. Four different uh, services, if you will, available on the same under the Azure App Service umbrella. And it's running on the same engine, same host, same uh, which offers you the ability to build a web application, whether it's a web-facing property or it's a web, web API or it's just a web service. It's the same stack. You can choose how to expose the capabilities of your application through a web application stack. At the same time, you can choose to expose it in a mobile-optimized uh, way using mobile apps. So all the capabilities at a mobile uh, app platform, like push notifications, customer engagement that it offers, including API gateways, just becomes available to what you thought started as a web application. So this essentially gives you a multi-channel uh, app framework so you can start building and, and mix and match services uh, or capabilities between either web or mobile to build an application which is modern and uh, targeting the new generation of users. As part of this announcement, there are two new services which were announced as well. One is called Logic Apps, uh, which is an interesting name and we'll love your feedback on that as well. Uh, which is our business process, workflow, orchestration, automation, pick your favorite term. We thought about like 25 different names before we finally said, let's find something which is not too old school, uh, doesn't seem very wacky, so we came up with a rocket icon and a logic app name. So uh, for what it's worth, this, this, is, this is the name we, we went with for now. Uh, but it essentially is our business process, workflow, orchestration engine uh, with a very, very, very easy to get started uh, experience, and then helps scale by the ability of you know having very, very complex processing logic, and we'll see some of the, the some of this in the demos as well. But more importantly, is a fourth bucket here, which is the API apps. Think of these as connectors to any system that you have today, whether it's running on premises, running in 
uh, different cloud. It could be even a legacy system, which has, does not even talk the normal web language. It's a connector. It's an IP that you can build, or it's an IP that we've partnered with uh, first-party providers, third-party providers, or built it in-house to go connect to the most uh, frequently used data sources and systems in the back end. So as part of the offering, initial offering, we shipped a whole bunch of API apps and connectors, everything to connecting to uh, consumer SaaS offerings like Facebook and Twitter, but also to SAPs and DB2 and uh, Yammer and Box. And the whole point is it's a heavy ecosystem play where this list keeps expanding and keeps expanding so that we can bring to bear the value that we've got, uh, not just as SaaS connectors, but also any custom connectors that either you folks in the room build or you've already built and want to bring to market and uh, in, in monetize it. So all of this platform is bundled in a way where it's available for a single one low price to start with. So you do not have to make a choice between I want to use feature A, feature B, which platform to go after. You start with the Azure App Service. It's one unified offering. And then you can choose which, whatever capabilities you want. And you scale up from there as your business grows. And that's, that was a, the non-technical uh, dimension of making sure that the whole stack is available to the masses for them to go start out uh, building richer and new applications. So uh, <clears throat> at this point, I'm kind of run the risk of either losing you to the lunch promise, or I can show you some demos and, and, and get this a little bit more exciting. So demos, more slides. OK, demos. Demos, awesome. A few more slides. A few more slides. Oh, OK, the answer is pretty obvious. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to skip a few slides, come back to it. And in fact, the whole point is I would love to make this more interactive. At any point, feel free to stop us, ask questions. And more importantly, give us feedback on what uh, makes sense or doesn't make sense. So to make all of this real, I'm going to skip a few slides of saying, hey, what these individual offerings are, but actually show you some of this uh, in, in action. And while Stephen is wiring up, just not, not to show you the, the few icons I had earlier, but talk about all the other connectors, everything from the ones that you're probably familiar with in the BizTalk world from you know, talk to mainframes, IBM, uh, all the protocol handlers across FTP, HTTP, but also talk about the other connectors which are available out of the box. So ask Stephen to come up stage and walk us through what this actually looks like in real life. Um, so I'm going to uh, give an introduction to Logic Apps as they exist in the Azure portal. Um, just for context for me, how many of you have actually used the new Azure portal? Great. So at least half. Uh, so this will be familiar to you, which is good. Uh, so in the new Azure portal, you can come in and we have uh, a plus new experience that gives you uh, categories of all the services that we have in Azure. Um, so we have compute, of course. Uh, that's where you're going to find your typical infrastructure as a service. Um, and Logic Apps, along with all the other app service offerings. So uh, these, these are the different offerings that you just saw on a slide. It's, it, we made it real here. So you have web apps, uh, mobile apps, Logic Apps, and API apps. So I can just come in here and I can uh, select API or sorry, Logic Apps. And whenever you create a resource in Azure, uh, you're going to be asked a few basic questions. Uh, obviously, you're going to have to name it. Uh, you're going to have to uh, also choose a resource group for that, uh, for that service. Uh, so the resource group is an important concept. It represents the deployment boundary for, uh, for your service. So in this case, um, I've uh, already created one for, for this demo. Um, and the other thing that you have to choose when you create a Logic App is the app service plan. So this is the, the thing that you pay for, um, that for that one low price, as Kron mentioned. Um, and you can put all of your different services onto the same app service plan. So um, in this case, I'm going to create a Logic App, but I also have connectors that I've set up and I've put onto the same plan. Uh, so that way, it's all running on the same compute. It's all running together. Uh, so that way, it's fast and uh, you pay for it just once. Uh, so I'm going to uh, create here. Demo app. And then I can click Create. Uh, and it defaulted all those other things there. Um, so instead of just waiting for that provision, I have a, another empty one that I've created uh, right here. Uh, so once you've created a Logic App, you get this, uh, this experience uh, that uh, gives you uh, a, a blank canvas so you can add as many different uh, connectors to as you want. Uh, so let's watch this load up. 
blazing speed right here. Um, and what I did is I already, uh, into this resource group and this app service plan, I created a Dropbox connector and a Twitter connector. Uh, so what we're going to do today is we're going to create a simple scenario where I want to archive tweets about Microsoft Azure. Uh, so I'm going to save them up to my Dropbox. Uh, to do this, uh, we're going to start with a very basic trigger here called a recurrence trigger. And uh, all this does is this just runs my logic on some fixed interval. Um, for demo purposes, let's run it once a minute so that way we don't have to wait a long time. Um, and then I just click the check mark, and uh, there we go. So the trigger is the thing that starts the logic running. Uh, so there's going to be a variety of different types of triggers, and uh, in the session after this one, I'll, I'll talk about the, the different types that we have. But um, this one is quite straightforward. It's just, uh, just a recurring schedule. Um, let me zoom out a little bit, fit some more content on the screen. So uh, the next thing that our logic is going to do is we're going to go out to Twitter and we're going to search it. So we're going to uh, click on the Twitter connector. And uh, this adds uh, a card. Each card represents a step. Uh, you can think of it as a shape. It's a, uh, the, the atomic unit of logic that you have. It's the kind of the smallest thing that you can represent. Uh, and what these actually are is these are calls out to APIs. So for every card that I add, it's adding another call to my application. In order to make calls, of course, you need to have some sort of authorization. So uh, we, have a, we support many different OAuth providers in this platform. Uh, Twitter, of course, Dropbox. Uh, we also support other types of authentication. If you use cert-based auth or uh, basic auth, we also support those natively here. Uh, but to authorize OAuth, you know, you've probably seen this before, you get this, uh, this consent dialog that pops up. Um, and what this will do is this will ask me to authorize uh, logic apps to use my Twitter account. So in real life, what this would be is this may be a company Twitter account that you use um, to, to track your social engagement. Uh, so I'm going to click Authorize App. And uh, then Twitter will uh, redirect us back into the Azure portal, uh, indicating that uh, we're, we're authorized. So what, we're do what we'll see now is we'll see a list of capabilities that this Twitter connector exposes. Uh, each connector has a, uh, a JSON file that actually describes all the capabilities it has. And it's called Swagger. And you saw that a little bit earlier in a, in a previous demo. And, and that Swagger contains, for example, a list of operations. You can see here that there are four operations that we think are really useful. But um, you know, there's a full list if you want to get uh, additional details, if you want something, you, know, you want to get user details or other, other advanced capabilities. Uh, but for purposes today, we'll uh, just click on Search Tweets. And then specify the query. So I, I care about Microsoft Azure, obviously. So let's uh, search for that. Did I spell that correctly? Looks like it. And click the check. So uh, you see what it did there is it actually looked at the swagger and found the inputs to this particular operation. So the, the search operation takes just one parameter, in this case, the query. Um, and it has a series of outputs. So these outputs are rendered here for you. And uh, every time that we go out and we get tweets, uh, there's some text associated with it, how many times it's been retweeted, and uh, who it's been tweeted by. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to add Dropbox. Uh, so I'll click on that. And just like with Twitter, it adds on a card. And just like, like with Twitter, we're going to have to authorize this because uh, Dropbox just uh, requires OAuth consent in order to be able to use its service as well. Um, and what it's doing right now is it's talking to the Dropbox servers and it's figuring out uh, what that consent uh, looks like. Um, so I click Authorize and once again we'll get this pop-up. Uh, once again I'll have to authorize it and uh, give Dropbox access to my Logic App. And I think that went through because I had, I had primed the pump, so to speak, before the demo. <laughs> Um, and now I can choose the operation that I want to do. So we're going to upload a file. Uh, and this file will contain the tweet. So uh, whenever I click on an action, I, of course, get the set of inputs that we have. Um, this is a little more complex than searching Twitter. Uh, it's more than a query. There's actually four inputs here that we need to provide values for. Um, so as you'd expect, a file path. Uh, so I'll do this uh, you know, latest, latest tweet. Txt. 
and then the content. So this is uh, kind of where the key power of logic apps comes in, in that you can flow values from step to step. Uh, so when I click this uh, dropdown right here, what you see I see is the actual outputs of the Twitter action. Uh, so I can just select tweet text here. And what this does is this every time that every minute that this runs, it will take the outputs of the API call to Twitter. It will put them in a message and it will pass that message to Dropbox that it then uses to upload a file. So this file will contain just the text of the tweet. Um, and I can choose encoding. You know, if you used a binary file here, you could use base64. And I can choose whether or not to overwrite or uh, not. So there we go. So this is our, our app that's going to run. Uh, so I'll click Save. And if that turns green, and we know it's saved successfully. So uh, what happens now is this is now live and running in the cloud. So every minute that. Box. Uh, so let's uh, take a look at this. Um, the other thing that you can do if you are even less patient is you can click Run Now, and it will run the uh, Logic app immediately. Uh, so let's see if that happened. And I'm going to switch over to my Dropbox. If I can find the window. OK, so what we can do now is we can come in and we can see the full history of execution of, of this Logic app. Uh, so in this case, at 350, I just uh, hit Save. And uh, you can see here, it shows me the, the steps of execution. So it looks like it all succeeded. So in order to prove it, hopefully my Dropbox will load. See, it's not just Azure that's slow today. And uh, latest tweet.txt. And this is always a little bit of a gamble, because who knows what people are tweeting about Azure. <laughs> it's usually good things, though. And uh, I'll open a notepad. I should have, uh, ooh, look at this. So this is the file that I just downloaded. So Microsoft Azure Amazing Scale from Service Bus. Uh, I don't think anybody in this room did that, but you know, maybe they did. Uh, oh, did you? Oh, OK. <laughs> it's ru ru ruining Azure's image by astroturfing. Um, but uh, no, that's good. So uh, as you can see, it's, uh, that was a real tweet uh, that got uploaded into my Dropbox. Uh, so uh, whoops. In case you can't tell, I'm not mirroring. I don't trust this projector. Um, but uh, the, the other thing you can do here is you can actually inspect the, the inputs and outputs of all these actions. So as these messages flow through the system, uh, all of them are archived into, into your system. So I can come here and I can see the Twitter connector that ran. Um, I can see the outputs that it had. So in this case, uh, the inputs are going to just be the, the query that we passed in. So this was Microsoft Azure. But I can also see. Uh, what came out of it. So this is going to probably be an array of tweet objects. And that, those tweet objects are going to contain those same fields that we saw on the, on the designer surface. So you can see uh, the tweet text, Microsoft Azure, Amazing Scale, uh, the tweet ID, the created, and it, it, it was, was Dan, in fact. Um, he wasn't lying. So, and you can see uh, the other tweets that have come in about Azure, uh, Logic Apps, uh, some uh, launch for student developers. Uh, so you can see here uh, all of the, the data. And then, of course, uh, you can have the same experience for Dropbox here. Um, now, one of the things that you may notice, though, is this isn't super useful because uh, it only uh, will upload the, the latest tweet, right? So I, I kind of skipped over an important detail here, which is, uh, this, uh, the Twitter step, it outputs a single, or it outputs an array of tweets. But this Dropbox action, it only took a single file and uploaded that single file. So that isn't actually what you'd want if you want an archive of all of your tweets. You want the full list 
of tweets available to you in your Dropbox. Uh, so we have some slightly more advanced capabilities that you can use uh, in order to do this. So you know, this, is, this is a traditional looping scenario. So I, I have a batch of tweets that I output, and I want to be able to iterate over each of those tweets and upload them to my Dropbox. So I can do that here. Uh, so to do that, uh, I can edit this action, and I can go to this gear menu and say, uh, uh, repeat. And uh, what I pass into this is I pass in the array that I'm repeating over. So you can think of this as a, a classical for each loop. Uh, so I can go back to this drop down, and you can see um, it's showing me the body. And the reason I'm seeing this and not, say, the tweet text or the tweeted by is because we're intelligent in what we select. So we show specifically the outputs whose types match the specific input field. So I can go here and I can say body. And now if I, if I clear this out, Instead of selecting the, uh, the first tweet, it will actually show me the tweet text of the repeat item. And the repeat item, you can think of it as the index in your loop. So you know, if you're thinking from you know, i, i from 0 to 100, it's kind of going to be you know, the array bracket i. Um, it's the thing you're iterating over. And the other thing I'm going to do is instead of uh, having a, uh, a static file, I'm going to create a, a, a file that backs up every single tweet. So um, I can do, instead of tweet text, well, let's do tweet ID. Oops. Tweet ID. And there we go. So now what's going to happen is if I save this, uh, right here, uh, within a minute uh, after this runs, uh, every time that it, it, will, it will run, it will search Twitter, get a list of tweets along with their tweet ID, and upload that file to my Dropbox with the tweet context. And if we come back to the main pane, I can just make that run manually. Where did my Dropbox go? And let me hit refresh. Let's see if that was successful. <coughs> oh, it failed. I did something wrong. So uh, when you have a failure, uh, so this is, this is actually intentional. I'm showing our debugging capabilities. Um, when you have a failure, you can actually see exactly what has failed. So uh, just as the outputs link shows you the uh, things when, or the capabilities when things are successful, you can also see when something goes wrong. Um, so here, let's take a look at all these outputs. And uh, the message is null. So that isn't a particularly helpful error message. Um, but uh, you can imagine that that, uh, that connector could have had a more verbose error message if you wanted. So looks like that part of the demo I will not do right now, but I can do that again in my session, which is after this. Oh, no, it seems to have worked, actually. That's weird. But let's take a look and see what we have. Well, let's see if it's opening up. I think so we've got a lot more detail about <clears throat> how do you debug, how do you actually build more rich logic apps as well. But what we want to do is give you a flavor of you can point and click, start with a very simple Twitter Dropbox. And along the way, you can start growing up, adding loops, adding reference. And it becomes a very, very easy ramp to being able to you know, realize the strength and power that you really need for an enterprise-like scenario. But you don't have to get everything right from day one. And you can assemble a lot of this stuff by point and click. And uh, I think there's one more thing that Stephen probably showed is the code view. Yes. Which is Does it, can anybody read that? I don't, I don't <laughs> know. Is, that, is that about Azure? I see IoT and Microsoft Azure in it. But uh, anyway, that's the, that's the tweet. So it looks like it may be just a reporting thing. But uh, let's go back here. And we can go in here and we can go back uh, to this designer, see the code view. And in this code view, it uh, represents the, this is a, a simple JSON template that represents uh, all of the steps that happened. And uh, you can see here, here's the trigger. Uh, so we're occurring every once a minute. Uh, the Twitter connector. Um, 
and then the Dropbox Nectar. And you can take this, you can check this into source control, you can parameterize this if you want to deploy it across multiple environments. Uh, so if you're a developer and you don't really like all that point clicky stuff um, all the time, you can drop in here and you can get access at the, the, raw, the raw code that backs it up. Great, thank you, Steve. I think that the last point is very critical to note, which is we want to start with a canvas and a designer and a no code experience. So you can start for, you know, ask, as easy as how you would probably use uh, simple workflow tools today on your phone, but then have a very simple, seamless path to be able to grow to a code view where you can do all the traditional uh, development best practices that you do and completely skip the UI if you had to. So it's the same engine, same power that, that powers or uh, enables the same technology set to be available whether you are a very, very novice user or you are existing integration in MVP and you can actually code this in your sleep. So, uh, what, what I want to shift gears a little bit and talk to you guys about is this is not just uh, about building a new stack for doing uh, business process and, and workflows. One uh, other very critical investment area we talked a lot about earlier was the ability to connect across uh, the enterprise. And hybrid is a super, super critical area of investment. I think Paul talked a lot about it as well in the what's going on in the on-prem world. But one of the things that served us well with the BizTalk Services version one was the ability to go uh, punch through the firewall with an agent and reach to data sources which are typically hard to access. And a couple of interesting patterns get, you know, come out of this is you cannot just run the integration workload on premises, and we'll talk about that in the next few slides after demo, but also run the orchestration in the cloud while reaching data sources and LOB systems on premises. And that's where you know, the true power of cloud, which it can reach, reach across private, hybrid, on-prem, and seamlessly scale as needed to be able to do orchestration and uh, integration across these boundaries. So with that, I wanna sh uh, shift gears and saying, the things that you're typically used to with you know, your EAI, your artifacts, and have Prashant come up and just do a very quick demo explaining what the next generation of BizTalk services and complexity built on top of app service looks like. So do you wanna plug in? Sure, yeah. Thanks. While you're doing that, the scenario, I think, uh, so, and the goal is to imagine, you know, all the uh, services and connectors that you build or protocol handlers you build and how you bring that in the left palette that uh, Stephen walked us through. That is powered by the Azure Marketplace. So you can offer your connectors, your APIs, and make them available to all the 100% the of the Azure audience. And, you know, day one, you start getting a, a market and a, and a con customer base, which can go benefit uh, from your set of investment that you've been, you've been working on for years. And the point about the hybrid was very critical, which is it does not have to necessarily be things that are running in the cloud. You could build connectors for things that run on-premises and still reach out through the cloud to talk to those systems and do orchestration. So the last six months, uh, <clears throat> what we just saw was we've been hard at work doing two things. One is, we took all of BizTalk services as we know today, and we re-engineered on top of the core Azure app service engine. And that's the engine which gives us continuous integration, it gives us auto scaling, it gives us DR. All the goodness of what, whatever Azure websites had is now available to Azure uh, Logic Apps as well. But in addition to just replatting, we also brought in all of the new capabilities that you, know, you had asked us for, be it rules engine or being able to run XPath queries, and integrating it with the rest of the flow so that, well, there's more interesting battle landscape. Uh, but the, the point being, <clears throat> we are not just you know, making changes at the, the fundamental uh, architecture level, but also going deep into adding a lot more feature set that enables more high-end traditional BizTalk-like uh, capabilities that you probably used to. So with that, <clears throat> just want to talk a little bit more about uh, next steps and share the roadmap of where our investments are going to be. Just a quick recap, uh, web apps, we didn't go into showing a lot of web and mobile app being built today, but you saw how you can connect an existing HTTP endpoint or listener, uh, which could be hosting on web apps to go connect with Logic Apps. But then a lot of the power and value is in the API apps, which are connectors that get used. So the example that Prashant used, SQL Server was running in the cloud or was it on-prem? It's running in cloud. It's cloud. You could have the same connector using hybrid, which is part of the same Azure App Service offering, and connect to a SQL on-premises and it would just work the same way. You would still get the same level of analytics, troubleshooting, code view, the JSON uh, format, all of it in the portal out of box 
as you would get if the service was or the endpoint was running in uh, a cloud. So, <clears throat> one uh, the best way you can you know you can help us and give us feedback is try our hands on what you just saw today. Of course, it's very very early uh, bits in terms of first preview. We would love to hear your feedback on how uh, you see both logic apps as well as being able to integrate your own API apps. And would love to hear get a lot of feedback on what uh, new connectors you need or what connectors you guys can help us build and offer through the gallery and marketplace to expand the ecosystem. And uh, of course, you can get all you know, the started. If you're an MVP or an insider, you can definitely have access to Azure already. But you can get started on uh, Azure.com. There's, I think there's some HTTP try, as, try app service or Azure.com, which is a free trial, uh, no credit card, nothing required. Just go get started and just start giving us feedback on what, what you like and don't like there. In terms of the areas of investment going forward, we are essentially prioritizing all our work in one of four uh, big work streams. First and foremost is what you just saw is, of course, a very, very early preview. And well, there's a lot of work to be done here, a lot of feedback we'll probably get from you all and, and iterate. But we are in a cloud cadence model where every week we come up with new updates and new updates. So stay in touch with us on the blog and uh, keep hearing about the new updates. But we'll be in this constant data-driven mode where whatever connectors get used, whatever features are required, we keep listening to feedback on forums and blogs as well as direct interest from you guys on here, and make sure that's part of, becomes part of our roadmap and backlog. And that's a very, very uh, interesting way. You know, instead of sharing three-year roadmaps, we don't have three-year roadmaps anymore because we, our roadmaps get defined by what you tell us today. That's what goes into backlog, and we prioritize for the next three, six, nine months. So that's a model we are in, and you, you keep us, uh, you know, hearing from us very frequently and sharing w way earlier features that typically haven't been baked in the traditional sense for you know, three years before they get released, because if it's built, it's at, it adds value. We're more than happy to share it uh, as a preview with, with you all and get your feedback there. The second thing is targeting all of the capabilities that you just saw running cloud, make them available on-premises as an on-prem offer as part of Azure Pack. So any of, uh, how many of you are familiar with Azure Pack? Not too many. So just a quick 30-second uh, background. A lot of the Azure services that we built, including Azure websites, service bus, some of the caching, we take the same bits and package them in a, an offering called Azure Pack, which runs exclusively on-premises in your own private cloud. You can download, for, download it for free, search for Azure Pack, and you can download it for free, install it, run it, and it, it gives the same capabilities of, of what <laughs> Azure websites or service bus and a couple of other uh, offerings do in the cloud, can, can do it on-premises. Because this is built on the same stack as Azure websites, we plan to take all of Logic apps, API apps, uh, web apps, mobile apps, and ship them on-prem. Of course, after we, we uh, got into GA of the service in the cloud first. So we'll first prioritize getting with rapid iteration to get into GA of the service, and then bring it on-premises so that if for whatever reason you cannot use this in, in the public cloud, you will have it available on a, as a private cloud offering as well. The third thing is we are still uh, <clears throat> on track and prioritizing our investments to ship the next major uh, release and update for BizTalk Server in 2016. Of course, it will follow on close heels of uh, the next generation of Windows Server and SQL Server, so as soon as that's done. And you know, without sharing a lot of more details on what's happening in the BizTalk Server train, the main goal is to bring value that we see in the cloud, a lot of the learnings, bring it on-prem, of course, make it ready for being you know, running on the latest and greatest version of not just the database and operating system, but also the connectors they can connect to to get value, uh, including all the work that Paul talked about as well in our on-prem work stream. The fourth, and that is, that is by far the most important investment area uh, for me and my team. It is to grow the ecosystem in a way where it's not just about, I mean, it's great that we do a lot of community outreach and talk about blogs and forums, but do it in a lot more technical and a uh, business way. By that, what I mean is, everything you saw today is API accessible and is available to be you know, extended and sold through and monetized. So the, if, you, you know, if you're pro dev and you love to do this through APIs, you can skip the entire UI that you just saw to submit JSON files and, and the whole engine will work. You can skin it the way you want. You can build any extensibility and scenarios that you want on top of this, the platform and sell much higher level solutions uh, be it vertical specific, be it geography specific, be it customer specific, 
extensibility is core, core at, at the heart of the platform that you can use and leverage. So we take care of the, the running the backend and auto scaling and DR and backup while you focus on high value scenarios in solving financial, healthcare, pick your uh, vertical of choice and, and bring all the benefits of what cloud can offer, but in a way where it can be customized and branded and re-offered and repackaged in your own offering. That's one, one big area. Second big area of investment in the ecosystem world is the land of, eco of API and connectors. We saw you know, about 20, 25 connectors we ship with. We keep adding more and more connectors as we, we hear about them or we get feedback. But I would strongly encourage and request you all to contribute ideas for connectors and more importantly, actually build connectors which can be part of the, the, the Azure uh, Logic Apps gallery. And uh, over the next few months, we'll also enable uh, commerce and marketplace on top of that so that you can actually start monetizing a lot of the APIs uh, <clears throat> that, that you build with has special IP. So if you build some very special connectors to some very hard LOB systems, you can actually be, you'll be able to sell those connectors and, and make money of them. <coughs> so that's the second area of, in, on, second dimension of growing the ecosystem in a way where you're not just helping us uh, support the, the community, which is great, and we really thank you for your support, but actually get in, in, into the cadence of innovating and shipping and monetizing the same value that we, we want to bring to our customers jointly with your help and, and to your customers as well. We not only are on a high bandwidth uh, ship cycle, but also on a high bandwidth uh, conversations and feedback loop, so we build a product that actually works for you guys. So that was a URL I was talking about earlier, tryappservice.azure.com. Go, take it for a spin, you can do it right now on your iPad or a, or a Surface, whatever you have in your hands. It's pretty easy, just point and click, you can actually see it in action, customize it, and then you can take it forward by signing up for Azure if you don't haven't already. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, we'll definitely connect you guys to the rest of the team uh, who's visiting from Redmond. But it doesn't stop tomorrow. It will be available even when we get back to Redmond. We'd love to hear constant feedback from you all. And thank you again uh, for joining us. I think we'll take a short break and then go into a deep type session with uh, Stephen on Logic Apps. So looking forward to hearing feedback and connecting with you guys today. Thank you. Thank you.